Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in to this Futures Seminar. Today we mark the launch of our quarterly publication, the fourth edition of our quarterly publication, Farsight, Visions of a Connected Future. The main topic of this issue is one concerning the future of connectivity. Here, in this issue, we explore novel developments and everything going from quantum computing to the digital advertising industry to artificial intelligence to the future of dating and much, much more. You can grab a copy by visiting our online shop or by becoming a member of the Institute to make sure that you do not miss out on any future editions of Farsight. However, for this particular future seminar, we're going to be focusing on one topic. You see, something interesting happened in December of last year. A rare moment occurred where it really felt like parts of the future had slipped into the present. A couple of months ago, OpenAI's large language model, ChatGPT, was released, marking the first time that the wider public had gotten free and unlimited access to a tool using artificial intelligence. Since then, social media has been flooded with strings of witty prompts and amazement over the usefulness of the tool, but also a sensation that things could get really weird really quickly. So, ChatGPT, how do these models work? How advanced are they today? And how advanced could they potentially be in the future? What does it even mean to be human in a future where many of the tasks which we consider our species experts at can suddenly be done far faster and perhaps even better by artificial intelligence. My name is August Lillianberg, and I am an editor working with the publications team at the Institute. For those of you who might be new to us, we are an independent non-profit futures think tank. We work across the spectrum of futures and foresight and have been doing so since our founding in 1969. With me in the studio today, we are privileged to have two very special guests, Cecilia Valner Felgenstam and Daniel Hershkovich. Cecilia is an AI artist working uh, Cecilia is an AI, AI artist who, with her art studio Artificial Mind, works with machine learning, blockchain, and other cutting-edge technologies to create interactive artworks which provoke reflections on human engagement with technology. Daniel is a tenure-track assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen's Computer Science Department, specializing in cross-adaptational language model, cross-cultural, the adaptation of cross-cultural uh, language models, and ensuring sustainability, welfare, and responsible behavior through these language models. Welcome to the studio, Thank Cecilia you. and Daniel. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. So I think a really good way to kickstart off this discussion is to talk about ChatGPT. And I'm wondering, when ChatGPT was released in December of last year, you both work with AI in some capacity, Cecilia, you as an artist, and Daniel, you as an academic. Was the release of ChatGPT met with a similar level of excitement within your industries as it was within the wider public? Daniel, how about you? I would say yes, uh, mainly on social media and uh, within my nearest surrounding, there was very uh, positive uh, impressions about it. I would say, though that um, my uh, surroundings is closer to the general public than to the people who develop this model because I'm not part of a big company, uh, a big AI company like Google or Facebook or OpenAI for that matter, where I'm sure that the people sitting there would have had different ideas, uh, maybe on uh, models that they're developing and can't say much about and were maybe missing from the discussion, but just to say within uh, my field, um, there were a lot of people who immediately ran to experiment with it, ask it a lot of questions and uh, t tweak and see what we can get out of it in terms of positive um, results, but especially uh, challenges and things that uh, are obviously still missing from it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what we do for a living, trying to find out where this technology fails, uh, or at least a lot of us. So there was a lot to play with when it came out. All right, interesting. And Cecilia, in the art world, how was the release of ChatGPT met with excitement? I think most people were really excited. And uh, in the same regards, of course, the excitement is around, whoa, how much new things you can do with this technology and how you can experiment it and how it enables you to experiment in a really easy way. Now you don't have to deploy the model yourself or something, or the machine learning model yourself. 
And then, of course, also a lot of kind of like reflexive reasoning around where might this take us? What are the biases in this model? How is the model reproducing certain worldviews, not other worldviews, mm. etc.? So, of, of course, a lot of questions around also how will this model be a mirror of certain power dynamics in our human right. society, in our data society, and also, of course, excitement around how you can use this model to work differently in your creative practice. Because if you are an artist working with machine learning, then of course the machine learning models are, you know, co-developers in your creative process. So of course it's also always exciting when a new technology comes out. But I will also say that following the field, so I've been working with DPT models for quite some years in my artistic practice, mm. you know, back to the days when you were really excited when it could write a coherent right. sentence. And now we're at this really complex scale where it has the context awareness and where it can really understand a context at, at a new level and where it can write software code and, mm. you know, all kinds of things. So it's this thing around how going from kind of like small types into wider and wider context understanding which I think is, um, of, of course, extremely exciting and, of course, also raises a lot of existentialistic and ethical uh, questions. Yeah, of course. And we're going to return to some of those existential and ethical considerations a little bit later. But I think first, a good idea is to clear up some of the definitions of what we're using today and how this technology actually works. And Daniel, you work with natural language processing. Sure. Um, could you explain to us how such large language models which G chat GPT is based on, yeah. how they work and how they understand human language. Yeah, I can try. Although I understand there is a lot of controversy on even of using course. this term, but uh, just in terms of what the thing is, uh, language modeling is something that has been a task in NLP for decades, where it's basically uh, modeling the distribution or probability distribution of text. So just saying what is the next word that's the most likely to follow a given context. And uh, there's been a lot of work on trying to get more accurate models because it's not really a well-defined task always, um, since there could be many different words and who says what is the right one. Uh, but uh, just using data to train these models has become the uh, kind of every, what everyone does, and more and more data is always better. And that's one of the central um, building blocks uh, in ChatGPT, or maybe the most important one, which is also what GPT and GPT-2 and GPT-3 do, is just language modeling, just saying what's the most likely next word, you could say. Um, but I think what's also new that they did for ChatGPT is that the second component, which they call reinforcement learning from human feedback, in which they actually train it further really as a chatbot, rather than simply as a text completion model, mm -hmm. where uh, they used a lot of uh, human, or employed a lot of human workers to say what uh, is the, their impression on the f answer that they get from the model, and whether it's cooperative, whether it's being harmful, um, polite, and so on, so that it would improve with that respect as well. Um, so all, all in all, it all uses machine learning as the kind of uh, nuts and bolts. Um, I don't have to go maybe so deep into the details there, but mm. that's overall how it works. Right, so I mean, it uses probability to predict, given a set of texts, mm -hmm. predict the next set of texts. So if I say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, <laughs> it will take that and respond accordingly, right? Is Wait, that, am I understanding yep. that correctly there? Respond accordingly, you mean by continuing the, yes, by continuing the poem? The uh, most according, probable answer. According to what uh, uh, most occurrences of that beginning um, have uh, been observed in a large uh, set of mm. uh, text uh, documents. Um, of course, if the precise beginning of the text has already been observed many times, it's easy. Mm. That's something we've known how to do well um, a long time. The thing here that's more special is that <clears throat> it can generalize even to similar contexts. And then, uh, and, and it's not new to ChatGPT or to GPT-3. I guess you could say it's uh, new to using neural networks rather than n-gram language models if you want to be uh, technical about it. But uh, it can be, <clears throat> uh, it can refer to similar contexts that it, it has seen before. So even if you say, uh, if you modify your beginning a bit, like, I don't know, you say uh, twinkle, 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 mm. or something, um, it would still be able to continue maybe in a, a crea creative way, 
also according mm. to what your beginning was. Creative is something that we ascribe as like the word understand, but uh, at least the impression that people get from it is that it can right. do things like that. Okay. So I'm wondering, since it has this predictive ability and it's based essentially on scraping large pieces of data, reading loads and loads of content, and that is what the, the, the chatbot is basically based on, are there some things where these chatbots and these models where they perform better than others and are there some shortcomings to this technology when we think of artificial intelligence well um okay so uh, yeah that's uh, basically the uh, what everyone from my field or a lot of people from my field have started to uh, investigate as, uh, as soon as it came out as i said before and a few things off the top of my head that uh, people have observed is, um, I think one important thing is access to knowledge. There is no uh, guaranteed uh, truthfulness to the answers you get out of, an, of a language model. And that I think is also a result of that fact that uh, it uses similar context or finds similar context and completes similar responses to what is seen in training. So it can obviously come up with uh, ans an answer to a very common question or a, like a very common poem mm -hmm. like you just cited, but if you ask it something a bit more esoteric, it will come up with something that looks likely, usually. Yeah. Um, like if you ask it to uh, complete the list of uh, books by some esoteric author, uh, but more often than not, there will not be actual books by, by that author. So that's one uh, clear limitation that you should not be relying on this technology for factual information. Right. Okay. And I think that's a super interesting way to transition to our next topic, which is about these potential societal implications of chatbots like ChatGPT or future iterations of artificial intelligence. Because we've already seen many real life use cases of ChatGPT, not just people on social media using it to say funny things, but people actually actively using it in their workflows, mm -hmm. and integrating it there. Now, on the one hand, some people are actually quite anxious about this development because for those that work within tasks that involve a lot of writing or language-based work, they might feel like these chatbots and artificial intelligence might replace their work or automate away their work. But on the other hand, you also emphasize how they're not designed for truth. Mm -hmm. So is there some kind of way in which we can use these models to enhance our capabilities and our capacities as humans in a workplace setting, rather than relying on them entirely. But Cecilia, what, what do you think? So, so I think that for me, the important thing around these models is that it's kind of like a collaborative technology. So when I look at chat DPT or other DPT models, of course they can be used to write loads and loads and loads on, of fake news that can go on mm. social media or whatever. And of course that's something that we need to be extremely aware of and really think around how can we make sure that that's not taking over the kind of like the truth of our democracies yeah. on the one hand. But then if we go into a more kind of like practice of working on a daily basis with these models, I really think that, and, and also as you're saying right now, you cannot really rely on the facts, right? But let's say one year from now, two years from now, whatever, maybe the facts become better, who knows? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think the important thing still is that, you know, when you write something or when you produce something, it's a lot around kind of like having an intentionality. It's a lot around wanting to bring something into the world. You want to, mm. you know, have a theme that other people should think about or something. And, you know, these models, they, if it writes a poem about love or if it writes a software code or, or if it's um, making a recipe for, uh, for dinner tonight, you know, right. it, there's, there's no kind of like intention behind it's it's at the end of the day it's mathematics right so there's something around kind of like that as humans when we collaborate with these models because as you say it can write kind of like a text way faster than us and it can write millions and millions and millions of pages really snappy and it looks really good and often it's written even better than i could do it but the crucial thing that we need to cultivate as human then i think is that we should cultivate what do we have at our minds? What do we have at our hearts? What, what is it we want to communicate? Because then we collaborate with the machine learning model, the chat GPT or future GPT models, to bring our intentionality into the mm. world. So it's a collaboration between the technology and the human, where you at the end of the day as the human being is the one looking at what you're generating together yeah. with the machine learning model. And 
making sure that it has the direction you want. Because else we end up in kind of like a world with, you know, cognitive and information overload. Like, what should we use all these productions for, right? Mm. If it's not for communicating, for sharing something, for, for gaining knowledge, for, for wanting to kind of like make us as humans and societies take the next step, make new knowledge, etc. So, so I think there's something around that co collaboration. And of course, that is also a rich collaboration. Because if I'm writing something, and then I, I'm writing with ChatGPT or whatever GPT model I'm using, then it might suggest something else, and that might spark my reflection. Mm. I might be, oh, that's right, or that's not right, or that was not what I wanted to say. Maybe that's what there's most people saying online or whatever it, the data set was that it was t learned from. But I want to write this, and then you write, and that prompts the, the GPT model to, to continue writing with you. So, so I think there's really something around that we should cultivate our human awareness. We should cultivate what we have at our hearts and our mind. So in a way, with, with these models coming out and, and the th development generally in the field of machine learning or AI or natural language processing, it, as human beings, we should cultivate our humanness. We're living in a time where the technology starts doing a lot of the tasks we, we used to do, but there's still some extremely human traits and capabilities that, that we really need to cultivate. Mm. And, in, in, and in that regard, that also enables a potential new space for us where we can start actually using more time as humans and societies and cultures to actually cultivate what we have at our hearts and minds. What, where right. do we want to go together? What kind of societies do we want to develop and move into? So, so hopefully it could also release some, you can say, time and capabilities for us humans to actually cultivate the, the shared cognitive space we have and the cultures we share together. Yeah, may I add to that? Yeah, of course. So I think it's actually a rather gradual change we've been through in the past, mm -hmm. I mean, millennia maybe, <laughs> with technology assisting human creation, because you could say that Writing used to be a lot about the calligraphy and uh, the technical part of uh, putting pen on paper, where today there's nothing to that in most mm -hmm. writing, I think, where people just sit in front of a computer and, and type. Um, and it doesn't mean that writing has become uh, meaningless or that people don't need any skill to that, on the other hand, uh, or on the contrary, now they uh, can spend more time on the maybe core of the, of mm -hmm. the art. And at least I have been using language models for writing ever since I got a keyboard on my, on my phone that completes or it lets me choose maybe three options for whatever I type. And I don't always uh, know in advance what it's going to predict, but I usually pick what it's predicting. So I think uh, it's already been here for a long time. Yeah. And I also wonder when we consider some of the work and some of the content out there which ChatGPT or these models are particularly good at producing, we think about a lot of posts, a lot of content on social media, a lot of content on the web which is optimized for the stuff that will bump it to the top of the search engine of Google. Mm -hmm. Is this really the kind of content which we as humans are worried, we feel threatened by a machine taking over? Would it not actually allow us to you know, explore more what, what, what is at the heart of human creativity than using our time and considering creative, you know, SEO optimization, for example. So, uh, so I definitely think that's a really great point. So I think there's, it's kind of like a two-sided coin, right? Mm. So on the one hand, there's a lot of creative potentials. There's a lot of kind of like, it's not like the chat GPT model or another machine learning model, model suddenly woke up in the morning and <laughs> you know came to existence out of nowhere, right? As you're talking about, it's a gradual development f mm. throughout years, right? Ending here where we are today. So that being said, I, this is a truly kind of like creative potentials that these model, models bring forth. But we also need to be aware that, as we're talking about, they're trained on data. So as such, they're also a mirror of the bias and biases in the kind of like human worldview that is mostly online, for example. So, so I think there's also something around that we need to be extremely aware around developing greater levels of, for example, transparency in terms of what is the data sets that we train these machine learning models on. So for example, right now, ChatGPT is not open source, right? Mm -hmm. so, there's something, so, so, it's, so there's also something around the power positions and the closeness in some of the development of, of these models that I think we should address. Because yes, of course, it's around being creative and writing and 
doing all kinds of stuff. But still the technologies we engage with, for example, also like Google, right? Yeah. It presents also the world to us in a way. So if I Google, you know, I look at the first page, I don't yeah. go to page 24 and I don't know what would be at page 24. And that is the same thing with this model. So it will reproduce kind of like the, the biggest normal taking for granted worldviews, but who says that is kind of like the best worldviews? So there is something around that we should really challenge the way we assemble the data set and we should challenge kind of like or, or be extremely reflective and have great democratic discussions around what what is the world we want to reproduce in these models because these models will also learn from the world they're trained on and that is the future world that will be presented to me in the my collaboration with the model. Yep. So there's definitely something around being extremely aware about the transparency and what is it, what future do we want to move into? Because at the end of the day, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, chat DBT and other DBT models, it is in a way more of the same. So, so there's something around if we want to move into a world where we're taking a little better step there's something around how can we make data sets and train the machine learning models so they help us in a way go in the direction we want. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think like to echo what you say, a lot of the talk right now about large language models and AI seems to reflect the discussions we had about the internet in the 90s and early 2000s when there was an aspiration that the internet would be this democratic and somewhat decentralized open source sphere. Mm -hmm. And we've seen recently that, you know, those efforts have been curbed more and more. We talk about we need a new kind of internet. Well, now we're in the potential beginning stages of this technology, we have to make sure that they are also produced in a democratic manner. Yes, but also, um, and by the way, there's a lot of people working on making it more transparent, mm -hmm. not just by better protocols, but better technology to reveal what the training data is used for each uh, prediction, which I think is very positive. But we can get a bit philosophical or provocative and say humans in a way are also just trained on a lot of data we've experienced mm -hmm. and we've seen and we've been affected by and there's been definitely information overload on the internet for a long time. And so what is this that we're actually afraid of when we say uh, what if a language model produces the top results in a search engine? What is the crucial difference there? Um, is something that I think is a live, yeah. lively discussion in mm. the philosophy of, uh, yeah. of this field. And I fully agree. And to that, I would also say that before these models came out, when you had the printed press or news press or whatever, yeah. it's always good to have discussions around what is the world we, we, we are reproducing in kind of like our shared collective uh, atmospheres, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is totally, it's not a new discussion at all, but mm. nevertheless, it's still really important. Um, and I think one of the kind of like the things around these GPT models and machine learning models generally is the thing around how, how in a way, how do we make sure that there's still a rich open source community in a way? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's extremely big models. So, we, for example, in my studio, I have, I have a team of uh, four uh, people working mm. in my art studio and the software developers, three of them. Uh, so we do a lot of, um, yeah, GPT development and uh, machine learning and natural language processing uh, coding. And there's something around we use to be able to run the models. And now the models are so big yeah. that it's kind of like, it, it becomes so expensive to run them. So it, mm. we cannot even kind of like aff afford to, to do it in cloud. Yeah. So, that, so, that, so there's something around who has access right. and who, ha who does not have access. Exactly. And, and right now, of course, it's also the thing around that it, it's not open source, the chat DPT, but hopefully soon there'll be an open source mm. model, which is a little different, maybe a bit more parameters. Yeah. But, but so it's, of course, a continuous development, but there's something around how do we ensure that it's not only the big, extremely wealthy companies or corporations that becomes gatekeepers. But how do we make sure that small companies and artists and researchers and, and kind of like, yeah, the rest yeah, of us rest of can us. actually also be part of developing the models and using them. So I think that's also a big question that is, yeah, really present right now with, with the size of the models coming out. Absolutely. And I think it's risky for two reasons. One is that we simply risk uh, losing the competition as academic researchers and as practitioners who don't come from the big companies, which is maybe a trivial thing, but uh, to us it's worrying. Mm -hmm. um, but I think another crucial risk is that, um, like you say, we don't know who controls what content comes out of it, either explicitly by uh, inserting some more training data or tweaking the models in ways that we don't know, or implicitly by simply 
uh, coming from a particular culture um, where, for example, data selection for ChatGPT or for GPT-3 was done with some uh, process uh, of uh, selecting high quality data. And a recent paper that I read said, what is high quality is actually very cu cultural dependent. And uh, it, it seems to be, in this case, simply corresponding to particular uh, social groups within the US that mostly correlate with that type of language. Mm -hmm. um, so implicitly and without intention, the companies, by releasing these models and not letting others participate in their development, inject their culture into what we have to do um, when we continue using these models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also that brings me to a point. I, I read an article on Time, Time Magazine recently which spoke about the hidden labor that goes into some of these models, such as OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT. And it reads that OpenAI used Kenyan workers on less than $2 per hour to make ChatGPT less toxic. Here, OpenAI hired a firm that hired some Kenyan workers to sift through all the harmful content that, might, that was used to create chat GPT and tag it as you know harmful NSFW or not and some of these workers had to go hours upon hours per day sifting through some really obscene topics online and I think there's also yeah yeah a tendency when we talk about structural unemployment caused by artificial intelligence and anxiety that we might be replaced that we undervalue the actual labor and the, the hidden labor going into this as well. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. so I think that is a good example of something that's extremely common in, in that industry, in the AI industry or the machine learning industry. So often when we think about artificial intelligence, right, that's, that's a topic you use in kind of like the broader public and it gives this kind of like association to an AI that's self-learning and self-sustainable mm, and came yeah. out of nowhere, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, if you're in the industry, you would call it machine learning, right? Yeah. And, and there's something around from a kind of like public point of view that you, you, it's self-learning artificial intelligence and then you know around kind of like the software developers there's been a lot of Hollywood movies around kind of, of like primary white male software developers <laughs> drinking Coca-Cola or whatever right mm -hmm. but the thing is the true thing is that when you have machine learning that's one side and then on the other side data is crucial and the, there's a big industry and a big workforce around data work. So there's data work is scattered all around the world, which is low paid workers in a way, slaving away to keep the wheels of the tech industry running. And that's something you're pointing towards. And it's not only with chat DBT, it's a general thing in, in most of the machine learning, uh, or most of the technologies mm. based upon machine learning, that you have labor that needs to s sample the data set, score the machine learning models, take down uh, so like content moderators taking down wild content from the internet, uh, yeah. people scoring if it's uh, saying something unethical, whatever. So you have a, a large workforce that's really an underpaid workforce that's scattered all across the globe. So it's also something around a global exploitation that, that's taking place that we'd, you know, we never really think around. A, a lot of people don't think about mm. this workforce and it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And the tech industry is also doing quite a lot to keep it in, in the shadows. All right. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sorry, you were going to say? No. Because I, I, that's absolutely a problem, maybe a third problem of uh, big companies doing all of that. Um, it's not always transparent and it's not always the best of the um, workers or the community mm. that in, that's in their mind. I don't think it's an inherent limitation um, or an inherent thing with this technology. We could also imagine a situation where every one of us is a language model trainer for the purposes that we care about. Um, and then we don't have to be the low paid workers, but we could just replace our um, maybe labor intensive work that we do right now that could be substituted by AI by teaching the AI to do it for us. So I think that there could be positive mm. sides to it, but we have mm. to be careful to go in that direction, not mm. the other direction. So it's like almost creating this kind of self-sustaining ecosystem where our job is automated away from AI, and then we, we train the AI ourselves mm -hmm. to take the job that we once had in, in some kind of theoretical sense. Yeah, which a lot of people already do. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the natural language processing researchers, I suppose, um, or not a lot, but some like to use our own technology to um, just uh, annotate text or 
uh, use it for purposes that can actually be useful in real life or offer it to, to companies uh, that, that later can use it or to customers that can later use it. That's what we've been doing, doing for years already um, to create these data pipelines that can then automate tasks and not uh, necessarily rely on uh, low paid workers for it. So again, it's not a new thing. Hmm. It's just in this particular case, it happened that uh, it hasn't been done necessarily with the best uh, um, conditions of the workers in mind. Right, interesting. And I just have one thing I'm wondering about. A couple of weeks ago, Copenhagen Business School announced that they were banning using ChatGPT in exams and in essays. Yeah. And I myself, I have some friends who go to Copenhagen Business School and they protested saying that ChatGPT is like any other tool we use and it's nothing, it's nothing more than how a calculator was viewed uh, in the mid 20th century in educational institutions. It's like a word spell checker. It's like using Grammarly. I mean, you work in an educational institution yourself and I'm sure you've got many views about this yourself. I mean, what do you guys see this like do you guys see ChatGPT as being an equivalent to these tools, given that it doesn't, it's not designed to produce true information in the same sense? Or can it just be used as like a, a sidekick to a student to solve problems and write essays? Is that okay? What, what do you guys think about this decision by CBS? Well, um, I don't know that I have the answer on what's the best thing to do about it right now, but in some sense, yes, I think it's a lot like a calculator. We used to um, put a lot of uh, focus on students being able to calculate, or we, or people used to, to put effort on students being able to calculate things in their head. And now it's not so important because in real life you have a calculator, of course. Mm. And the question is, in real life, do you have ChatGPT to solve the writing problems that you'll have to do? And now we can get even more philosophical and ask, are the exam questions are actually asking questions that are relevant for people sure. uh, like in what they'll have to do in real life? If not, then why are we having these exams in the first place? <laughs> um, so that's an unrelated question to AI, but I think that AI opened this box maybe that maybe soon we'll have to deal with. Mm. You see, yeah, what do you yes, think? No, so I, so I actually agree. So, so I think in a way you cannot roll back the development, right? These GPT models are here and that's the future and it will just become, you know, better and better in a way. So, so that's bigger and bigger, take a larger part in our daily lives mm. uh, in the future. So, so I think the question is, is more like, like when Google came out, was it then cheating to Google something, right? As, as you're saying, it's, we have Google at, at our phone or at this extension of our hands now. We will have chat GPT or the future GPT models at the extension of our hands. So, so the technology is here and we will engage with it on a daily basis. So I think it's more around kind of like, what do we want people to learn in our universities? And you, if you want, like with calculation, right? Mm -hmm. If you want something, someone to be able to calculate without a calculator, you make a test where you can only enter yourself into the room and you have a blank piece of paper and a pen and then you sh make sure that people learn to calculate because then they have to practice before they go into that room. So if you want people to be able to resonate without DBT models or Google in the future, you make tests that make sure that, that people learn these skills. If you, because another skill is of course to be in the present and be really good at taking in using the tools at your hand and putting that together into a, a paper mm. or an essay where yeah. you had something you want to communicate yeah. and where you, you know, and that's also how it has been with Google. So I think it's more around kind of like thinking around what, what knowledge do we want the students to leave the university with and how can we make tests and kind of like knowledge environment that makes certain that we kind of like facilitate, facilitate and develop mm. these skills and, and the, kind of like ways of thinking and ways of doing whatever we're doing in that specific universities. Yeah. So, so, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a good way to ban it because what else should we ban? Like, you know, going back in time, then we should have banned the calculator or whatever. Mm. So I think it's more about kind of like if you want, because I think it's nice also to have skills of calculating, for example. Yeah. But then you make a test <laughs> sure. with that without the calculator. Mm. And if you so want... we could see maybe in the future now with ChatGPT, we have tests which go back to like the old school exam days where it's without a computer, you write in hand maybe. And you, and you already have a lot of tests in, in kind of like 
subject or areas of um, of studying where that's it's a lot of areas it's already like that so mm. i think maybe yeah so, so so i think maybe it's more kind of like certain universities for example copenhagen business schools where they don't usually have so many tests without uh, normally you can take in a computer sure. into the test right so 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 uh, so i think they just in a way need to rethink when mm. can you use tools and when when can't you use tools so perhaps in a business school where it's about the values in a business school and that, that kind of university are more focused and centered around synthesizing knowledge, critical mm -hmm. thinking, you know, source evaluation, where chat GPT might actually be beneficial to some degree. But on the other hand, if you're talking to a medicine student who needs to, you know, as part of their education, they need to memorize all the things about the human body. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. In that kind of case, I would feel uncomfortable if my doctor was consulting chat GPT. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, I know, for example, that you know, ChatGPT, along with a professional, is a far better answer than just a professional themselves mm -hmm. when it comes to a doctor advising someone. But I guess I wouldn't want that medic to be to not actually have any understanding exactly. of the human body itself. I would want them to have memorized something, mm -hmm. I guess. Exactly, and yeah. this also points to new kind of like skills that the students or that become even more important for the student. Students mm. at, for example, Copenhagen Business Schools or other universities where you're kind of like working with broader societal and business-wise context. Mm. So it's around kind of like looking at a text, seeing is this real, is it fake, having the intention, what, what do you want to bring out, mm. being extremely critical in terms of what, the, what chat GPT Mm. Right, like you are when you're on Google. What is the source of this information? Understanding the biases exactly. that program doing. And of course, that's a problem, right? Because mm. you don't know what the sources are for the chat GPT. So as a student, of course, you need to be reflective around how you use at the moment, at least. Who knows in the future? But at the moment, you need to be, if you're writing a, whatever analysis, of course, you need to be extremely reflective about it if you can count up a chat GPT mm. wrote. So you have to bring that into a critical reflection. Yeah. in the report around the sources you're using. But that's not different from when you find a report on Google or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not sure that it's important that doctors can memorize all the facts about the human body. Though I like to say they need to have an understanding so that they can critically inspect the answers that they, they would get out of AI. But I think it's unavoidable that this and many other professions will be augmented by, by AI. So um, maybe the most critical thing is to test students on solving the tasks that they are uh, studying with AI uh, mm. in collaboration. But for that, we do have to redesign the examinations that we do mm. to uh, find ways where this actually discriminates uh, the ability from not being able to do that. But I think it's uh, still very early stages and a lot of institutions are very conservative about exams, it's a, it's a touchy subject. But I can mention, for example, that publication venues within my field, uh, who are, I think, much less conservative and are also have this uh, inside uh, view on it, um, in uh, natural language processing, uh, allow the use of JetGPT to write re or to assist writing research papers for uh, some of the venues, but uh, they say if you use it to come up with new ideas, then it's unclear and you shouldn't do this because then there is an authorship question of who came up with right. the ideas and who should be listed as an author of the paper. But if you just use it as a writing assistant, then by all means, uh, it's okay to do it. It's actually in many senses preferable because why would we waste all this, this time on a badly written uh, papers that then reviewers have to read and also on writing these papers if we could just automate the process of going from ideas to paper. Again, it seems to be about automating things to get us to figure out what we really want to do mm -hmm. with society and humanity um, rather than some kind of massive existential risk. But I want to also touch upon that. I mean, it's clear that these models have profound implications on society in the future, but they also seem to provoke a reflection on how we humans engage with technology through fears, anxieties, and also excitement. Um, and Cecilia, you with your art studio, Artificial Mind, in one of your art exhibitions called Frank, you explore this really well, I think, about this kind of, this, this deep feeling that we have some kind of existential dread over a being that's somehow more intelligent than us. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about that exhibition? Yeah, so where Frank and some of my other artworks are kind of like, 
humanoid technology that mm. you communicate with. So you basically talk uh, out loud into the room and there's this kind of like voice answering you. Uh, and what I've been working a lot with in these works is kind of like how this humanized technology, so for example, ChatGPT, Frank mm. was made back in 2016 and it has mm. continuous been developed with new, more, better and better GPT models. Uh, but of course, the essence of Frank is still, still the same. But there's something around how kind of like these humanized technologies has a lot of seductive qualities in their nature because they kind of like can talk to us, uh, they can have say things that sound human-like, etc. Mm. So in a way we project, as humans, we project a lot of intentionality into the AIs and we in a way relate to the AI as if it was human. And as such, at the end of the day, often behind a, a an AI, there is a c company, right? And that yeah. company, if, if, the, if it's free to talk to the AI, the company often your, your data is often the company's uh, business model or if or it's showing you at least advertisement, right? Uh, so, so there's something around how, in a way, it's not a, there's, there's a power balance in this communication situation. So you're just not just talking to another human being, you're talking to a technology that's humanized and where there's, you know, a tech company behind that right. that maybe wants to learn more about your deeper feelings about X, Y, Z. So there's something about the, the seductive qualities that are really in, investigated. And then, of course, there's a lot around how, in a way, we also have a lot of hopes around how these artificial intelligences can maybe help us solve some of our uh, human problems around uh, mm. if, who are we and what sure. is the meaning of life on, on the one hand and of course we also know from kind of like research in, in the healthcare industry around uh, curing diseases etc. So, so there's a lot of great potentials in this but of course there's also something around at the end of the day we don't even know how the human brain works so, so how should an, a technology <laughs> be better at understanding what a human is. So, so, so there's something at stake there. And then of course the specific work, uh, Frank, plays on the, the novel around Frankenstein and how in a way there's this kind of like strange dialectic thing going on in, in the machine learning industry, how, how, how in the Frankenstein novel uh, the, the human being is really kind of like absorbed his research and he's, he's so absorbed mm. into his own endeavors trying to create lives that in a way he he doesn't think around how the human biases might end up going into right. this new entity and, and he ends up abandoning it and that's why it becomes evil. So there's something around how in a way we as human beings might be so absorbed in our creation of artificial intelligence that, that we forget to reflect upon some of, some of the red flags that come yeah. out and how, and how do we kind of like mis make certain that we don't end up with, with a technology that I wouldn't say turn against that, but that, yeah. we, but that we didn't develop taking into the future kind of like self-learning capacities of this. But it's not to say that we will end in some, some kind of like a catastrophe. It's, it's more to say that, that in a way as humans, I think we really need to be extremely aware about how fascinating these technologies are on the one hand, but of co and, and the, how they can help us do all kinds of things in our societies. But at the other hand, we need to be really aware and have discussions around what should use these models be used for, yeah. these machine learning models be used for. Because there's something around, I think up until now, it has mostly been kind of like the technology being developed and, and then it has been implemented into our societies. But I think there's something around starting asking more questions around what society do we want to move into in the future and how can we technology develop the technology that takes us there. Mm -hmm. so, so I think definitely we, we, we are at a point in time where we should maybe start being more reflexive and ha and having this as something that's actually wider discussed in our society because at the end of the day often technology is a really small subject matter for example in politics but it's something that in a way the Affects tech all of us. yeah the, and our the tech lives, industry yeah. is the biggest econ yeah. economic uh, kind of like um, yeah it, it drives our economies mm. <laughs> so 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 that, so there's some there's a misbalance uh, and yeah. I, so i think we need to be way more reflexive so we don't end up with a uh, a monstrous entity mm. turning against us. Yes, and for that, talking as an uh, academic, I think it's important. The education is maybe the most important to demystify this. And I am starting to, and probably will continue to, actually encourage my students to use this technology to or, or, uh, language models to write um, essays, so that 
they are sensitive to where it fails and what biases it might have, rather than having something banned mm -hmm. uh, that they will just use anyway without telling us, and then uh, it will not be regulated or assisted. I think it should be integrated as early as possible into the education. Yeah, yeah. and it seems like many of our fears, because I mean, some people, as soon as they see that, that, that ChatGPT can respond in a conversational manner, that's enough to freak someone out. Mm -hmm. As in, that is enough to be like, to get existential dread and have an idea that, okay, here is a being that we have created that is suddenly more intelligent than, uh, intelligent than us. But of course, there are different ways to measure intelligence, and we've been shifting the parameters of what is considered intelligent century upon century. But perhaps also, there is a f that fear exists because, I mean, like you guys said, this, I mean, these models, they're trained by human data. Everything they're fed with is created by humans. And given the track record of humanity, <laughs> that's perhaps not the, the best pieces of data that, that, that's going into these models if, if we do it in an unrestricted manner. And perhaps that's where some of the fear and anxiety comes from. If then some of these models use a higher order level of reasoning than we are capable of to take decisions based on what we humans have and what our humanity, humanity's track record, track record has done. I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, it's a really important and great reasoning that we need to do here, right? Because there's also something around if we were to say, okay, now we want to make an AI that's only trained on the best data ever, mm -hmm. on the kind of like the best human way of seeing the world, right? There's no really such an objective point of view where you could place yourself no. and develop an AI from. So, so as such, I think there's also something around in a way having a lot of competing models, having a lot of open models that, exactly. that we can train on different data sets and, 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 and hopefully that will enable us to, to continue being extremely also reflective around how the data of course feeds the perspective of, of the machine learning models and also ho hopefully at the end of the day, you know, these models should be, or should be made to make human lives better. Yeah. So, so at the end of the day, humans need to have wider discussions around what is the good life and how can these models support that. Mm -hmm. um, and of course you can have two AIs discuss what is the good life for a human <laughs> being and then in a way they would mirror what a lot of humans think. So it's not, you can look at that, but at the end of the day it's humans that need to reason around yeah. what, what, what the next step should be. Yeah, exactly. And I think it ties into the um, possible future that we said before, that uh, people will just be able to personalize language models. And I think there's already work on personalizing language models, uh, and maybe not to a particular person, but at least to a, a subculture, to make sure that it works well for a particular set of people rather than to everyone. But of course, there's a challenge because the uh, huge data sets that are uh, global, in a way, are exactly what brought us to this situation where the models work well. So that's one uh, active field of uh, development. Right. And on that note, I think we should move to the Q&A section of mm -hmm. this. Yeah. I have my computer under here yeah. with some questions by the, uh, by the public. Um, let's see what you guys have all come into. Right. Okay. Some of them have been already answered. We've got one about democratic distribution. Right, Henrik Hayes asks, what are the best qualitative research methods to explore ChatGPT experimentally as an emergent technology with inno innovation in mind? Qu qualitative was it? Or qu qualitative is yeah. there. Qualitative, okay. So I suppose what should you ask it in order to figure out whether it, uh, it makes sense or? I guess, yeah. What's the best way to curate your, your prompts? Perhaps what's the best way? Well, there. So, if you just want to get the best prompts, there are now a lot of websites that uh, uh, just collect them to uh, improve various uh, performance in various tasks. Uh, and I think uh, you can just look up uh, uh, awesome uh, GPT prompts and uh, things like that. But um, I thought it also means. How do you figure out whether it works well for your own task? And there I think it's important to ask it specific questions rather than gen general questions because the first thing that a lot of people do is just, uh, I don't know, tell me who um, 
the Prime Minister of England is. And that's a very, so one, it's a knowledge question, so maybe that's not the best thing to try mm -hmm. it out on. And another thing is, it's, a, it's something that a lot of people ask a lot of the time, and it doesn't have anything to do with a specific use case. No. So try to be specific and check whether it actually responds to the details of your case. But I haven't actually tried to use it for, I mean, okay, I have tried it for, tried it for writing, but uh, not for a variety of use cases, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, but I guess it's like not, not using it like you would use a Google search engine, right? Because it's not a knowledge-based tool like exactly. that. Um, right, what else have we have got? Um, Nicolas Montadon asks, will this not, as in ChatGPT, will ChatGPT not push us to develop new tools or mindsets to challenge the information we live with? So I guess new t will it not inc like develop new tool tools to manage this information yeah. overload we're yeah. about to get? I, um, I think that yeah. yeah. So I think it totally makes, makes sense also to have. So and these t new tools could also be uh, natural language processing models, yeah. right? So you could have a tool that was kind of like developed to have uh, less bias, and you could try to kind of like apply that to the text that you were, that GPT, Chat GPT was writing. Uh, so, so, so of course you can always c try to kind of like, yeah, make a specific machine learning model or natural language processing model that's fine-tuned to have a specific view on the world or on mm. the text, and then you could kind of like run that model on the right. text already produced. You could also have a machine learning model that was trained and been extremely skilled at finding if something was fake news or not. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or if it's fact or, or fiction or something like that, and then so so I think often when you think around AI from a kind of like everyday point of view, it's this kind of like self-learning entity and it's like one the AI, right? Mm. But at the end of the day, artificial intelligence from a technical point of view is a lot of machine learning algorithms that often built together to work to to do the task of, for example, being a conversational AI. So so as such, you could have a chat GPT model working together with another uh, machine learning model that was trained to kind of like look at it from a specific point of view and of course that could be fine-tuned into like yeah millions of, of areas and of course you could also work with in the future when hopefully it becomes more open source this technology could also work with fine-tuning it into to more specific areas as well mm -hmm. yeah all right cool and let's see what else we have here okay Karl Heinz Gluck asks what will LLMs that's large language models for the audience um, look like in 10 years time? <laughs> is there a ceiling for how advanced they can get? This is the kind of question which you probably hate answering. Yeah. That <laughs> <you're>, right? Absolutely, <laughs> because 10 years is, I mean, 10 years ago, I would have no idea that this uh, is going to be so big. And it, it's just, we just started with the neural networks in natural language processing, basically, or not even natural language processing. And for the audience, what is a neural network, if we can define yeah, that? Yeah, deep learning and neural networks are kind of the basic technology that drives the learning or the machine learning from data to estimate the probabilities of right. uh, words. So the really the mathematical uh, background for this, and they're using billions and billions of parameters so uh, gigabytes uh, and more of uh, data just to store the model that is used for the prediction here and the trend so if we have to uh, extrapolate about the future the trend so far has been that these models are simply getting bigger and bigger and the learning to um, approximate or s store or reason about more and more data um, as we go along and this seems to just continue but um, if I have to uh, speculate about something then one trend is actually making them smaller or preserving the capabilities with smaller models mm. for example exactly such that everybody can develop and use them um, and I think that's not just a technological advantage but the social uh, aspect of people actually being able to develop like we uh, discussed before uh, language models for their own use cases and purposes. So that's at least one thing that I can imagine will become widespread in 10 years. Right. Celia, do you have any idea what the horizon might look like in 10 years' time? I mean, I know GPT-4 is coming out <laughs> in this year, which is what's supposedly trained on trillions of data points. 
rather than the billions of GPT-3. Uh -huh. So, I mean, in 10 years' time, what could the ceiling look like? So, so to be honest, I think in a 10 years' time, we'll not be talking about GPT models. Mm. There will be <laughs> yeah, a new technology yeah. that's kind of like the big thing when we go into that future. That being said, GPT models and natural language processing and machine learning generally, I truly believe that that would still really drive our society, right? So it's a good question to ask. And if we stay in the field of the chat GPT and next generation GPT models, as you're saying, there's, there's a moving towards bigger and bigger models. And uh, there's also a move, movement towards kind of like bigger and bigger context awareness, so bringing in different contexts, right? So for example, if you go a little back, I, I was trying to write a poem uh, by uh, Hans Christian Andersen mm -hmm. style, but, uh, but about an AI. So now we're some years back. It was just for fun. I yeah. tried that small thing. Oh, let me try something. And, and that was really hard because it couldn't kind of like, it couldn't combine the context of AI text and Hans Christian Andersen's poetry mm. and style of writing. So Hans Christian Andersen is a, yeah, a fairy tale writer from, from here from Denmark. So, so, and now you can just write, I tried this, the, that was the first thing I then tried on ChatGPT, <laughs> right? And it got a totally spot on combining the kind of like context of right. the fairy tale and the context of an AI now being the, the main character in, in the fairy tale. That was a small example, but it's just to say, then you bring in the code, then you bring in everything, right? So what I would think we will see is that, you know, these models will uh, transform models or whatever the next models will be, will enable different, like now you can use them to write software code, you can use them to, uh, you know, to in the future uh, make a way of the construction of a house, uh, then you can 3D print it, whatever, right? So, so I think these will be tools and the next generation technologies will be tools that can help us in all kind of like our sectors where there is data uh, yeah. and where there is, you know, a, attraction of, of doing something. So, so in that regard, I think they will have t entangled the way into all of our work lives, ho right. hopefully in, in, in a nice and way because, you know, of course we can be way more efficient, but we can also have a, like without Google, right, I would have to rem have a lot of knowledge and I should, you know, have access to a library. Then Google came out and it was more easy. Then, of course, I have to cultivate my, my skill set looking at the information to mm. say is this good or bad information. So it's the same thing that now you can, you know, be an architect and you can have the machine learning model or whatever model it will be in the future help you come up with different concepts around how to construct a house that has the vision that you want. Yeah. And then you can look at it and then you can further develop. And I think it's also like worth mentioning to the audience as well that, I mean, the reason why we're talking about open AI so much is just because ChatGPT was one of the first instances of having, you know, a free and unlimited access to one of these chatbots. But there are countless of other companies and research institutions that are working on similar technology. I mean, for one, Google has been sitting on their large language model now for a while that they refuse to release uh, yet. In fact, I read somewhere that Google is becoming the, known as the place where engineers are taught how to train language models and then they leave and go to another place and release them to the public. <laughs> um, so we really are witnessing some novel developments and it's going to be an exciting future uh, ahead. Let's see if I've got any other questions here. Um, okay, one by Ghana Srinivas who asks, do you feel that centralization of this technology can be avoided? Is it possible and does it matter? And I guess we did talk about it mattering. We want it to be decentralized in some kind of way. We don't want large language models to be centralized in the way big tech is. But can it even be avoided? Or is this resigning to some kind of fatalism? What do we think? So, so, so I, you know, in the one hand, I don't think it can be avoided because there's already a lot of kind of like Mm. centralization around who, who is developing this yeah. and the, the money is put into it and you know this is a really big extremely expensive uh, industry and as you're also pointing towards and which is also a crucial thing right now is that you used as researchers in university you you used to be actually competitive in bringing out developing models right mm -hmm. and then you had so you had kind of like uh, researchers in, in the university and you had researchers in the um, in the big tech companies yeah. and now because there's so much more money within the tech companies actually they're capable of doing research that you cannot do in the universities yeah. so that's even more centralization of power okay. so I think there's something around that we need to success in making the the wider public uh, and wider universities wider open source communities working with these things because else it will just become more and more centralized yeah. that being said 
it is already extremely centralized, and I don't believe I would wish to, but I don't believe we can go all the way back. So, so, so. But I think now is the point in time where we really need to to step up and and figure out how we can at least make sure that it the, only, the, the, not the, only the ends in the hand of the few. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For example, we're making smaller models that are capable of the same um, abilities. I think that's one promise yeah. anyway, but of course also just having a lot of people work on this. In a way, it's similar to, I don't know, um, computer processors that are developed by just a few uh, companies and we always use the same ones. But, and, and that's of course a concern from a market perspective, but uh, this is different because it's also um, allows us to do different things and insert different bias into the output that we get depending on who develops the model. Whereas with a computer processor, it doesn't really matter, one could say. Mm. Um, so I think that's why it's important and I think it's also more likely that uh, people will push to democratize, democratize this. Yeah. Right, and that's interesting because we, we actually polled our audience on the YouTube audience, you guys over there, and we asked them, do you feel mostly optimistic or pessimistic about the long-term implications of AI on society? And they've done an overwhelming majority of optimism. 69% are optimistic <laughs> and 30% are pessimistic. And with that said, I think that it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you, Cecilia thank and you. Daniel, for being here and coming as guests for the Future Seminar. I think it's been a great discussion. Um, and yes, you can check out Cecilia's work by visiting her website, artificial.mind. No, no, artificialmind.ai. Artificialmind.ai. Forget what I just said, www.artificialmind.ai. There you can check out some of Cecilia's work if you're interested. And if you want to hear about some of Daniel's cutting edge research within natural language processing, you can check out his academic profile, at the University of Copenhagen's website. If you thought that the seminar was interesting, we hope that you'll consider getting a copy of Farsight via our online shop or by becoming a member of the Institute, making sure that you never miss out on a future issue of Farsight. We'll put a QR code up on the screen after the seminar is finished. Don't forget to follow our social media channels, to stay up to date with upcoming seminars, as well as all the fascinating work that the Institute engages with. Until then, thank you for tuning in. Hope you have a good day, evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever you are around the world, and see you at the next future seminar. Thank you.